am standing here this morning for one reason and one reason only. Because God is good. My prayer this morning is that God is lifted up, that Christ is exalted, that the saints are edified, and that sheep are fed. And I was sitting back here debating, well, I was debating whether I was going to doze off or not. I was debating whether I was going to wander down memory lane or not. And I've decided I'm going to, so if you'll excuse me, I'm going to have a couple of personal moments. Now, I, anybody who knows me knows that I speak well when I wander, but I'm sort of nailed to this area because of Facebook. <laughs> Facebook has so intruded on my life that now it even limits my movement. With Mother Ward being here, I, I just started wandering down memory lane, and I have so many good memories of this conference. I'm so thankful to be here again. I'm so thankful to Elder Spots for allowing me to stand in his pulpit one more time. It was a dozen years ago when my life was just disastrous. And on the tail end of all that difficulty and misery, Elder Ward decided, very kindly, to put me behind his pulpit. And this was a time when I was not even sure if I was going to continue in the ministry. And I got the schedule for the conference. I had attended the conference a couple of times. I had taught the children one year, but, but I remember looking at the men, the preachers of the conference, and just being so impressed with what they did and how they did it. And so uh, I looked at the schedule and my name was on it. And I was so excited. And immediately, even though it was a month out, my knees started knocking. <laughs> I was immediately nervous about the idea of preaching at Main Street. I called my friend David Morris and I said, I'm really scared because I've seen the men at the conference. I can't do what they do. And David wisely said, Elder didn't call you to do what they do. He already has them doing it. He called you to do what you do. Yes, sir. And for the last 12 years, I have been preaching and teaching at this conference and in several tributaries. And I am just so very, very grateful, not only for the opportunity to speak God's word, but just the multitude of friends I have made right. through this conference. And I mean good friends. I mean friends that have lasted the years. There is nothing I enjoy more than walking into this building and immediately meeting friends and Amen. brethren and people of a common heart and a common spirit. Yes. And I, I'm just so very grateful to all of you yes. for having me in your midst all these years. Bless you. It, it's really quite remarkable. All right, we are a Sovereign Grace Conference. My website is salvationbygrace.org. Uh, our church is called Grace Christian Assembly. And so I think you can gather what the topic's going to be this morning. I want to go back to basics. I want to go back to talking about God's grace. Because no matter how much theology we learn... No matter how much doctrine we gather, in the end, it all comes down to God is gracious. And were it not for God's grace, none of us would have any hope at all. We'd have no confidence in our eternity. We, we wouldn't be able to lay down at night and get any good rest because we'd be constantly afraid of the judgment of God. And so I am going to return this morning to talking about God's grace. Amen. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out a few historical realities. 
a lot of people who call themselves Protestant don't know why they call themselves Protestant. They don't know what the Protestant Reformation was all about. But this year is actually the 500th anniversary of the traditional beginning of the Protestant Reformation. It was October 31st, 1517, that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. And that is the traditional beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Initially, Luther thought that he could reform the church from within. Initially, he thought that if he just went to Rome and pointed out their errors, that they would say to him, thank you, Martin. We now realize the error of our ways. But by the time he entered Rome, there had already been a thousand years of entrenched Catholic dogma. And it was entrenched because the Catholic Church was the primary, well, the only monolithic church in Europe. And everybody was just sort of Roman Catholic by default. That period of time from roughly, from roughly 500 AD until 1500 AD, we still affectionately refer to as the Dark Ages. The reason that we call them the Dark Ages is because during that period, the people were largely illiterate. The Roman mass was held in Latin, a language that the common people did not speak. And as a consequence, and, and without having the Bible in their own common languages, as a consequence, the people just had to trust that whatever Rome said was just automatically true, which gave Rome the opportunity to make stuff up. <laughs> and they did. And the Roman Catholics don't like it when I say that they made stuff up. So I'm going to say it again. They made stuff up. And people just believed it. It was just dogma. They believed that their eternity was dependent on the things that Rome was busy making up. Well, it was into that morass that Martin Luther came. And during that period of time, uh, Tetzel, one of the cardinals in the church, was selling indulgences for the purpose of raising money to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica. And the idea was that if you just gave some money to the Catholic Church, that they could guarantee that your friends and loved ones would spend less time in purgatory. That's a jack. That's a ripoff. Because there's no way for you to actually check it. First off, purgatory doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. The idea behind purgatory is that you, when you die, have to go purge more of your own sin. You can hear the word purge right in, purgatory. The purgatory was the place you went and paid more of your sin debt. And that is tantamount to saying that Christ is not sufficient. The death of Christ was not enough to save you completely and utterly. You have to go to purgatory and pay some of your own sin debt. And then Tetzel and the Catholics tell you, well, you know, every time a penny into the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and so people were giving money to the church on the idea that maybe grandma would have a week less in purgatory. <laughs> There's no way to check that. Now, Paul... Now, Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the church because he wanted to begin a debate about these things. If you read the 95 Theses, most of them are about the selling of indulgences. This is what he was upset about. But in so doing, the church pushed back so hard that he realized that the only way to reform the church was going to be from outside the church. And so he, he protested the abuses of the Catholic Church. That's where the word Protestant comes from. It is protestant. We are protesting the abuses of Arminian and Catholic theology. 
And we are reforming the thinking according to what the Bible says. That is what Protestant reformation means. All right. And the theology that arose from the Protestant Reformation was Calvinistic theology. Call it by the nickname Calvinism, call it Reformed Doctrine, call it Sovereign Grace Teaching. That is still the theology that laid at the very basis of the Protestant Reformation. Or as I like to say, if they're not a Roman Catholic today, thank a Calvinist. People don't seem to understand that within the Protestant Church, and they have wandered a long distance away from the theology of the Protestant Reformation and have returned to the theology of Rome, the theology of works, the theology of doing good deeds in order for God to save you. And that theology permeates the modern Protestant Church. But the real protest is based on the reality that only God's grace saves people and that no amount of your works can save you. Yes, now, from the Protestant Reformation, there were five solas that were, that were sort of the hallmark of the Protestant Reformation. The first of them was sola scriptura. It just means scriptural law as opposed to the Roman Catholic idea of the teaching magisterium of the church or papal decrees, the Pope speaking from Peter's throne. Instead, the Protestant reformers said, no, it is only scripture that is binding on the conscience of Christians, not the ideas of the church. The second of the solas was sola Christe. In other words, Christ alone. Yeah. Only Christ can save you. Because the Catholic Church will tell you, you can actually go to Mary. Because Mary is now co-mediatrix and co-redemptrix. Oh, yeah. And that you can pray to Mary because she will go to Jesus on your behalf. And since Jesus can't say no to her, she's going to say, this is what I request on behalf of my people. And then Jesus will do it because he loves his mother. Okay. Sola Christus, back to Christ alone. The third of them is sola gratia, by grace alone. That salvation has to be by grace and not by works. Then sola fide, which is by faith alone. By grace alone, by faith alone. That's how people are saved, by faith in the finished work of Christ. And then finally, soli deo gloria, so that God gets all the glory. God alone gets the glory. Those are the five solas. This year, down in Texas at the conference there, we taught for several days on those soli doctrines. And I was able to teach on grace alone because that is one of my absolute favorite topics. As a consequence, Elder Spickard, David Morris, some of this material is going to sound real familiar to you. If that's the case, talk amongst yourselves, grab a nap, whatever works for you. <laughs> the Catholic Church and the Arminian Church says that salvation is a result of your good works. They constantly appeal to you doing good works as if you can obligate God based on the good works that you have done. That also assumes that you actually have good works, that you can actually do good works. No, you can't. Because you are far more depraved than you have any concept of. In fact, you are so depraved that you don't know how depraved you are. The Bible says that man's heart is wickedness continually. The Bible says that all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. The Bible says that we and our best state are altogether vanity. And so the Bible continually declares that you simply cannot do good enough works to obligate God. Let's take a few minutes and just see what the biblical anthropology really is. What does the Bible say about human beings? When God looks at you, because that's the only perspective that matters, when God looks 
looks at you, what does he see? Does he see you as a handful of aces doing fine and doing great? Or how does he really see you when he looks at you? That's the necessity of God's grace. Because the Bible says this about you. Colossians 1.13 says, He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. What does that verse tell you about you? First off, it tells you that when God found you, and by the way, you didn't find God, you weren't looking for God, you weren't seeking God, you weren't obligating God. When God found you, He found you in the domain of darkness. You were not all shiny, bright, full of light, looking for God. God found you in the domain of darkness and deeply entrenched in your own sinfulness. Which is why he sent his son to deliver you from your sin. But wait, it gets worse. Colossians 1 verse 21 says, And although you were formerly alienated, and hostile in mind, and engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in the fleshly body through his death in order to present you before him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. So what does that tell you about what kind of condition you were in when God found you? You were alienated from everything that was good and godly, in other words, you stood away from, you were not participant in, you weren't a citizen of anything that was good or godly. And you were hostile in your mind. You hated everything about God. You hated everything about holiness or goodness. You're alienated, you're hostile, and you're engaged in your evil deeds. That's how God sees you. So you're alienated, you're hostile, you're engaged in evil deeds, you desperately need to be reconciled, you're in darkness. Here's what Paul says his commission was from God. Starting in Acts 26, Jesus told Paul, get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, for what reason? To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, and so they will turn from the dominion of Satan to God. Yeah. So they will receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So again, what does this tell you about your natural state? According to the biblical anthropology, you need your eyes open. You are blind. You cannot see. You are in darkness. You need to be brought out of your darkness into the light. And worse, you are under the dominion of Satan. People get the wrong idea. They get the foolish idea. Is this too heavy for first thing in the morning? <laughs> People get the foolish idea that if they don't choose Jesus, if they don't make Jesus Lord and Savior, they have the impression that they're still kind of okay. That they're still kind of neutral. They're not all that good. They're not all that bad. But hey, maybe before I die, I'll choose Jesus and then I'll go to heaven when I die. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't allow for that. The Bible says that what you are is walking after the course of this world and after the course of Satan. If you are not in Christ, you are in Satan. Those are the only two options. You're either the seed of the woman or you're the seed of the serpent. You're either a child of light or a child of darkness. Those are the only two options. That's the way God sees you. In fact, I like to quote this. I, I stole this from my friend David Morris. He said, our natural condition is described in the Bible 
like blind men in a dark room chasing a black cat that isn't there. <laughs> it's our natural condition. We're desperate. You have to understand that, that God looks at us as desperately wicked. Yeah. He looks at us as enemies of everything that's good and righteous. Yeah. He does not see us as just neutral and doing fine. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And of course, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You're not even alive. You're not even capable. You're fully incapable because you're dead. If you don't understand the language of death, go outside, run up to a graveyard, and yell at the participants of the graveyard, the residents there, go and yell at them and see if you can get them to stand up and do jumping jacks. You can't do it. You know why? They're dead! Paul yanks off that language and says, you are dead because of your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, and among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of our mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That's how God sees you. That's how he sees you when he looks at you. Mm -hmm. And you think that people in that condition, mm. walking after the course of this world, after the course of Satan, after Amen. the prince of the power of the air, people who hate God, you think those people are one day going to wake up and say, you know what I should probably do? I should probably clean up my act and I should go to God. That never happens. It never happens because you don't have the capability. You don't have the capacity to think about the things of God. You're too busy thinking about the things of this world. And you're too busy thinking about the lust of your flesh and the lust of your mind. Because that's all you care about. You are incapable according to the Bible. So then someone's going to come along and say... Well, then what you need to do, seeing as that you're so incapable, what you need to do is follow the law. Because after all, God assigned the law. And so you ought to do the law, because if you can do the law, there's some amount of the law that is going to give you a positive righteousness, which you can take to God. Because admit it, we are all naturally, we love ourselves so very much, we, we're so fond of our own flesh, that we're just naturally legalists. We just want to do something. Yes. Because it's like an insurance policy. Look, if I die and God is there and he's real, then at least I'll have these good things in store so that when I get there, God will say, well, you did a few good things, and if your good things outweigh your bad things on St. Peter's scale, then you can slip into heaven by the narrowest of margins, right? No, because the Bible says, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise see the kingdom of God. Your righteousness has to be equal to the righteousness of Christ himself. Your righteousness has to be the righteousness that God approves of, and you don't have the capability of doing that. So some folks will say, well then get busy. Get busy doing the law. I was raised on that kind of religion. I was raised in the Lutheran church, which, let's be honest, is just Catholic light. I was raised in the church of do stuff. Every Sunday, the preacher would thunder down from the pulpit and tell me to do better. Whatever I'm doing now, do better. And one thing I knew about me was I couldn't do better. You're right, sir. I couldn't do any better. What I was doing was the best I could do. So it doesn't help if you tell me do 
better. I don't have the capability of doing better. So what did I do? Worse. I left the church. That's the only option I had available to me. I could either sit there and be browbeaten constantly that I just wasn't good enough, or I could just admit that I'm not good enough and leave, which is what I did. And I sold my soul to rock and roll, and that's how I spent my 20s. And then in my 30s, God called me back to himself. And since then, I have known that it was God's doing. It was God's grace. It was God's and that no amount of my work or my doing better was possibly going to save me. Yes. Yes. And then sure enough, as soon as I started believing that it was God, it was all God, it was grace, it was God's kindness, right away people start telling me, you got to keep some part of the law. You got to do a little bit of law, whatever that law is. And of course, Paul dealt with that all the way back to Galatia and Corinth. He dealt with the people who would come in behind him and say, sure, Jesus, yes, Jesus, but you've also got to fill in the blank. You've also got to be circumcised. You've also got to keep the Sabbath. You've also got to do some part of the law. James says that if you miss the law in any one aspect, you're guilty of the whole law. So once you start going down that road of a little bit of legalism, you better make sure that you're keeping all 613 rules of the law all right. and keeping the Ten Commandments. Right. Amen. And you better be doing it perfectly and perpetually for your entire life from the day you're born till the day you die Amen. because a miss is as good as a mile. Right. What does Paul say about the law? Paul doesn't say the law can save you. Look, let's get it right. The law was given to Israel in order to form a covenant with Israel. The things that are written on the Ten Commandments, the first writing of God historically, when he wrote the Ten Commandments and gave them to Moses, they were referred to as the letters of the law, which were put on stone tablets that are called the tables of the covenant. And these are the words of the covenant that are on the tables of the covenant that are put in a golden box that's called the Ark of the Covenant. You would think by now we'd figure out that's a covenant. And God formed that covenant with Israel. And he did not ask them if they would like to perform the law. He imposed the law on them. And told them that he would bless them if they did it and curse them if they didn't. How many people were saved by that law? None. Not a one. 1,400 years Israel was under the law. And not one person was saved. And yet, there are preachers today thundering down from Sinai yelling at people, telling them to do better, and telling them that they've got to do some amount of the law which never saved anybody. Amen. You're right, sir. What are they thinking? Uh, I'll tell you what they're thinking. I had a fellow write to me a few years ago. And he said, you know, that radical grace that you talk about, Jim, it was via email, you know, all capital letters. So I, could, so I could see that he was yelling at me. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, you know, that radical grace that you talk about, Jim, you, you, can't, you can't say that. You can't go around just saying it's grace, grace, grace. You can't. You got to put at least a little bit of law on people. Because if you just say grace, grace, grace all the time, people will go crazy on you. Amen. <laughs> that may have been the wrong place for an amen. And I wrote back and I said to him, I agree that if we're just talking about depraved human beings, if you tell them about God's grace and that there's no law against them, depraved human beings will in fact go crazy on you. But blood-bought, Christian, spirit-filled people already have the Spirit of God working as a governor on their behavior. Therefore, I don't need 
need to impose the law that never saved anybody onto those people because they already have the Spirit of God saving and redeeming and steering and telling them what to do in their life. They don't need me telling them what to do. They don't need me riding roughshod over their lives, telling them how many times they were wrong. What they need is the knowledge that they are sinners who desperately need a Savior, and then what they need to know is that the Savior is a perfect Savior who saves perfectly. Once they know that, they're not going to go crazy. You know what they're going to do? They're going to worship God who gave them that kind of freedom. And yes, it is a radical freedom. Yes. Paul would go so far as to say, there's no law against me. Not everything is good. Not everything is edifying. In other words, some things are just stupid. But there's no law against anything. He went so far as to say, I judge not my own self. Yes, sir. Oh, that was a happy day when I read that. Because <laughs> I was really good at judging me. Because, as we've heard several times from Pastor Washington, I know me. I know where I've been, and I know what I've done, and you don't want to know it. But when I found out that the salvation that God proffered through his son was an utter and complete salvation, and that there was indeed no law that could condemn me. In fact, here's what Paul says about the law. Starting in 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 5, he says, Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of the new covenant, and not the letter of the law, but of the Spirit. For the letter, get this right, Kills. What does the law do? It kills. But the Spirit gives life. But if the, what are the next words? The ministry of death. That's how Paul refers to the law. The ministry of death. Now to James Guyo or to Stephanie Legrand over here or to any of our regular listeners, they're probably surprised at this moment that I didn't yell the ministry of death. Because in my home church, every time I read that passage, and it's been frequently, I point out that the law is the ministry of death! Why would you tell people to follow Is it too early to be yelling like that? <laughs> Wait, it gets worse. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stone came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation... Okay, now, it's not just the ministry of death. It doesn't just produce death in everybody who follows it. It produces condemnation. The damnation of God is intimately... Involved and part and parcel of the ministry of death. And yet, I know I'm driving this point. And yet, 
You can turn on the TV today. You can turn on the radio today. You can dial up the internet today. You can walk in in any Arminian church today and you will hear somebody preaching the ministry of death. And I don't understand it. Yeah. Romans 3, 19 and 20 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, yeah. so that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God. Do you understand that the Pauline theology is, the reason for the law is to make everybody shut up, yeah. to level the playing field, and to hold everybody guilty, yes. so that God's grace yes. shines all the brighter yes. against the black backdrop of the ministry of death. That's the reason for the law. The reason for the law was to make sin all the more sinful. It was never for the purpose of saving anybody. So what's the answer? If it is true that we really are that depraved, that we're far too depraved to understand how depraved we are. If it's really true that even if we go do our good works, all our good works are just filthy rags. If it's true that we don't even have the law to run to for cover, that we're going to stand exposed before God as being wicked, sinful, God-hating people. What, what is the only answer? Where can we find hope? In the midst of our desperately deprived and depraved state. Where are we going to find that? Grace. God's grace. Because only when you understand how deeply divided the chasm is between you and God. Can you begin to understand the distance that he traversed to get to you. Because you are utterly incapable of getting to him. Amen. So he had to come to you. Yes. And oh, thank God, he did. Yes. Yes. Because if he didn't move, he didn't. there's no movement. Right. You're right. If he didn't, yes. in love and grace, in kindness and mercy, if he didn't do absolutely everything necessary for your full, complete salvation and eternal redemption, if he didn't do it, it's not getting done. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 4, says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Okay, that's why I began with the biblical anthropology. Do you understand how desperately wicked, depraved, sinful, God-hating, and satanic we were when God looked at us and loved us? That's astounding. It's no wonder that John Newton wrote amazing grace. It is amazing that God would be the least bit kind to people like us. Look, I know people that don't like me. Amen. And they have... Again, a weird amen there. Um, <laughs> and I get it. I get why people don't like me. I'm, I'm totally dialed in. I get it. But that God could look at a worm like me, that God could look at a maggot like me, a sinful God depraved sinner who every single day only did what the lust of my flesh and the Amen. lust of my mind could contrive. Yeah. And the weirder it was, the more I liked it. Yeah. And that God could look at me in the midst of all that and say, I love him. Oh, oh. I don't just love him, I sacrificially love him. Yeah. In fact, I love him so much. So much. I'm going to kill my son yes. to satisfy yes. my own necessary yes. wrath. Yes. My anger is so kindled at him yes. and my righteousness needs to be satisfied yes. and my justice needs 
A satisfactory offering, I know what I'll do. I won't demand it of him. I'll demand it of my beloved son, the only good and righteous one. And he will die in the place of that wretched world. Why? Because I love him. That's grace. That's grace, pure grace. That is God being kind to us in a way that we not only don't deserve, but we couldn't even conceive of it. We couldn't think this up. Look, every man-made religion on the planet, all of them, start with the premise that you got to do things to get the reward. Whatever the reward is, if it's your 70 virgins, then you got to go kill some infidels. If it's breaking out of the cyclic wheel of life, then you have to meditate your way to nirvana. Yeah. Whether it's, uh, I'm going to go down the eightfold path that Buddha left out so that I can find my way into the that that is behind all that. And way too much of Christianity says the same thing. If you want heaven forever, you got to do stuff. you got to get busy. you got to do stuff. Yeah. Every man-made religion, read them across the board, even... So much of the mythological religion of the world is all about men seeking God. Yes. Only Christianity, unique in human history, only Christianity, biblical Christianity says that God sought men. Mm. That it was God who was doing the seeking and the finding. Yes. Yes. It is God who did the work. Yes. It is God who did the sacrifice. Yes. It is God who appeased his own wrath yes. in the death of his son. Yes. And his son fully, utterly accomplished everything he came here to do. And as a consequence, you are fully and completely redeemed, which is why you can go now to the throne of grace, crying out the Father. Give up on yourself. I love the phrase, take sides with God against yourself. Yeah. And stop thinking that you're going to please him by your good works. Amen. Now, understand me when I say this. Because, and this is actually a line that I just recently stole from Keelan Atkinson. He said, I repeat myself because I want people to understand what I'm saying. And I want people to understand what I'm not saying. All right. I'm not saying Christians don't do good works. What I'm saying is wrong religion says do good works to get saved. Yeah. Right. Right. Biblical theology is you are saved. Yeah. Now knowing that, do good works. Yeah. The good works have a proper place within Christianity. When you hear me say, give up on your good works, I'm not saying, go out and sin all the more so that grace may abound. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the grace of God that saved you is the same grace that can instruct you, is the same grace that can restrict you, which is the same grace that can lead you, which is the same grace that can get you all the way home. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Why? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Do you understand why God did things the way he did them? Why did he give the law to level the playing field? Why did he make everybody sinful and guilty before him? So that 
All the denizens of heaven, hell, and earth are going to see the trophies of grace that he has eternally saved and brought into his presence so that they can see his glory, so that they can eternally worship him. Worship him. Look, God is in the enterprise of glorifying himself. And we really ought to just get in line with that. Because someday you're going to stand before God, not because you're that good, not because you're that attractive to God, because it just wouldn't be heaven without you. No, you're going to stand in God's eternal glorious presence so that he can say, look what I did. I saved the unlovable. I say the impure, yes. the unrighteous. Yes. I say God-hating enemies. Yes. And I did it all for the glory of my glory. That's why he's doing things the way he's doing them. Yes. That's why he's not going to accept your good works or your righteousness or your supposed self-righteousness. Yes. He's not going to accept the least little bit of that because that would be to take away from his glory. Yes. That would be to say that you and he together got you yes. saved. Yes. 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 And that's never going to fly in eternity. It's going to be God and his grace entirely, yes. monergistically, and no part of you. You are the recipient of God's glorious yes, sir. grace. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, starting in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. I like the word, you have been Amen. saved. Amen. Not you're going to be saved. But you have been already saved through the finished work of Christ 2,000 years ago. Yes, sir. And that... It's not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Amen. And by the way, if it's a gift, uh -huh. it can't be earned. That's right. Right. Because, and that was a properly timed amen, so that's good. <laughs> if it is by grace, Paul argues, it can't be by works, or else it's going to be a debt. God is going to owe you a debt based on what you've done. Paul says it can't be a debt. It has to be, in order to be grace, it has to be fully and completely unmerited. Amen. It can't be something that you earned. It has to be God being gracious. Yes. It has to be God demonstrating that eternal and wonderful quality of His. That He is demonstrating His own grace on the unlovable, on the sinful, on the depraved, on the God-hating enemies that were walking after the course of this world and after the course of Satan. God did it that way so that he could show his own grace. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of any work so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? For good works. The good works follow the salvation. You have been saved. Now do the good works. Which, Paul then says... Which were prepared beforehand so that you could walk in them. You don't even get credit for your good works. The good works were prepared by God beforehand. All you did was go along for the ride. And then you ended up doing good works because God is good. And because a good God worked through you, you did things that were intrinsically good. But he prepared them before you even did them. He gets all the credit. It's always been that way. It's always been that way. Romans 4, starting at verse 3, says, What does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, as grace, but as is what is due. But to the one who does not work. You see that phrase? But to the one who does not work. And of course, Paul's writing this to Jews who have 613 ordinances and the Ten Commandments, and they've got all the extra traditions that the rabbis have placed on them, and their whole life is wrapped up in work, 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 work. 
constant work, do the work, always the work, keep the religion, do the work. And Paul comes along and says, now to the one who does not work, no work at all, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Okay, so where does your righteousness come from? This is kind of the whole point. Your righteousness does not come from what you've done. It simply cannot. If we were to add up your good works and your bad works, your bad works far away, your good works, because even your good works are bad. If Peter does put all your good and bad works on a scale, it's tipping to the negative dramatically. Yes. If God were to judge you on the basis of your own earned righteousness, nobody gets into heaven. But where does your righteousness come from? Your righteousness is imputed to you, given to you as, as a gift and placed on your account. And that righteousness is the earned righteousness of Christ himself. That's right. That's right. Your sinfulness, your depravity, your god hatingness and everything you've done in this lifetime, all your filthy works, were placed on Christ, and then he died under the penalty of those sins. And then his righteousness, yes. his goodness, yeah. is placed on your account, yeah. so that when you stand before God, he doesn't see all the evil, depraved that's wickedness right, of right. you. Yeah. He sees the righteous goodness yes. of his son, yes. who he yes. eternally loves and yes. approves of. Yes. Yes. That's where your righteousness comes from. Yes. And it's not just a moderate righteousness. Your righteousness actually will exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Yes. Because you will have the very righteousness of Christ yes. imputed to your account. Yes, yes. It doesn't get better than that. No, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. Christ himself is your surety. Yes. Christ himself is your payment. Yes. He has totally satisfied God's wrath yes. and the sin debt that you owed God. And he did it by grace, 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 grace. Um, I'm nearly done. Romans 11, 6. No, I'm going to go to Romans 5, 1. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith. Oh, I'm so glad I read that verse. Now I remember what I was going to say. <laughs> Think about that for just a moment. You're going to get righteousness, genuine righteousness, true righteousness, imputed to your account because of your faith in the finished work of Christ. Because you have faith that Christ did everything necessary for your full, complete salvation. For that, you're going to get righteousness in exchange in the great economy of heaven. So where do you get the faith? The faith is a gift of God. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 12 says, we are looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. So even the faith that you exchange for your righteousness is a gift from God. He gets all of the glory. He gets all of the credit. There is no point at which you can say, I contributed. I did something. Move over on that throne, God. I'm going to be sharing it with you. Because between you and me, we got me saved. Well done, us. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That that is why I can sleep at night. That is why I can lay my head down. Because I have peace with God. Yeah. I spent so much of my life, as I've already told you, I spent so much of my life trying to do better and confident that I couldn't. I spent so much of my life afraid that I was going to trip, I was going to do something wrong, and God was going to get me. My concept of God was that he was up there in heaven judging absolutely everything I did. And as soon as I was bad enough, he was going to scoop me up and put me into hell and do it gleefully. That's what I thought of God. Because that's what the church had taught me about God. That God is the great eternal judge. And then when I read that we...
we are justified, held as completely forgiven, held as perfectly righteous, with the righteousness of Christ on our account, for that reason we have peace with God. I have peace with God today. I'm not afraid of God today. I love God today. You know what I can tell you? When I had that big, bad, scary God, I did not love him. I was constantly afraid of him. When I learned the God of grace and peace, I love that God. Because I know what that God did for me. Romans 11, 6 says, But if it, God's election to salvation, if it is by grace, then it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Romans 9, 16 says, So then it does not depend on a man who wills or a man who runs, but it depends on God who has mercy. I can keep going. I've got more material. But do you get the point? Do you understand that your legalism accomplishes nothing? And in fact, all it does is take you further down the line of the ministry of death. <laughs> Do you understand that? It's the ministry of condemnation. But do you understand that you are fully, completely, utterly saved? Saved. Now, at this moment, I'm thinking once again of Elder Ward. Because I was at Main Street one time early on in my ministerial career. And I was listening to him speaking between the preachers. And he said, I'm saved. And I thought that was remarkably bold. I thought, especially with my Lutheran upbringing, I thought, how can someone say that with so much confidence? How can he be so sure that he's saved? I'm here to tell you today. I'm saved. Because I'm saved by a perfectly good God. I am saved by a perfect Savior. Yes, yes, I am yes, saved yes, by the grace of God that yes, does not fail. Yes, God doesn't try to yes, say no. he's saved. Yes, 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 yes. God is not waiting on you to do anything. Yes, right. He is the one who chose you, who elected you, who wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. And someday when you get to heaven, he's going to open that book, point to your name and say, I knew you'd be here. Yes, sir. And wouldn't it be wonderful to be so involved in the things of Christ in this lifetime that when you die, when you close your eyes in death, and you wake up and see Jesus, won't it be nice if you can say, I was just thinking about you. Yeah. <laughs> You're my Savior. You're my Redeemer. Yeah. And I am dependent, utterly dependent on your grace, 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 grace. Yes. Now, every year at the end of the conference, we sing, preach the word, preach the word. Preach the word. The next verse is, speak of grace. Speak of grace. Speak of sovereign grace. And if I never ever see you anymore. Speak of grace. Let's make sure that's what we're speaking about. Let's make sure that's what we're talking about. Let's bring the people of God, the comfort of God, that can be found only in the grace of God. Now, if I never ever see you anymore, my love goes with you. I'll see you.